Okay, I'm going to give a second go at this explanation of the tire forces. Um, same thing that we talked about in class uh, that I just showed the various uh, lecture notes, but I'm going to write it out here and uh, get it recorded digitally, both uh, video and uh, via the pad. Okay, so what I asked you all to imagine was, <clears throat> let's think about a, uh, a tire testing machine. And in this case, um, I want to imagine uh, a tire testing machine that has a tire mounted on an axle. And that axle can spin about um, the tire can spin about the axle but also this axle is pinned at one end and rotates through some angle um, theta with a constant angular rate theta dot I'm trying to decide on some colors here so if I look at that draw sort of an axis down the axle here um, and then some nominal thing we're going to track theta uh, in this case theta dot is constant constant angular rate of this axle uh, rotating around this uh, pin joint on one side the tire will be um, rolling on the ground some surface and then we're going to attach a coordinate system um, to the tire axis. So I want to put a K hat going down, J hat going inboard, and I hat that way. And if I look at the top of the tire, we're going to be able to steer the tire so that we can change the angle with respect to the axle. So that's I hat, J hat, and then you can imagine if I rotate about Z, I'll be able to line I hat J hat like so relative to this axle that still stays in board. And the slip angle will define it's going to be with respect to the direction that I hat points. Also important that um, we'll be able to apply a, a rotation of the tire about its axle, which would be uh, about the j-axis, we'll call that omega. So a positive omega would try to make theta go negative. Negative omega in this case would make theta go positive. All right, so this is our tire testing machine, um, and we change two parameters. Those two parameters uh, are essentially omega that will control and alpha. And this is going to be related to the longitudinal slip of the tire. Alpha will be the lateral slip. And we want to try to think about 
what kind of forces are generated at the tire contact patch? What kind of forces are acting on the tire from the ground? Um, and what they will mean for motion of a tire that isn't necessarily in a tire machine. And we're going to think about that by um, thinking about two forces. Um, if I split this axle and measure the forces internally in that axle, then I can draw I'll re draw a um, two reaction forces that we want to think about. One is the Ry component and the other the Rx component of the internal forces here. So may, say we have a force sensor that we can put inside this um, axle rod and measure what those forces are. It's interesting to think about well, what does Rx and Ry mean? So Rx, if we measured a force on Rx, if we're rotating at a constant data dot, right, we're forcing this thing to just go around in a circle at a constant rate, then if we measure anything, any Rx or Ry, it's going to indicate that the wheel wants to speed up or slow down tangent to the circle that the wheel of the wheel's path. So this corresponds to thinking about whether the um, if we register any force there, then we know that there's some force generated that's trying to make it the velocity increase or decrease, accelerate or decelerate, uh, tangent to the wheel. So this ties to um, will cause um, acceleration or deceleration tangent to path wheel is following. And then if wheel path was not fixed. So we have a fixed wheel path, but these forces would tell us that if the, if the wheel was free to do it, and it would accelerate or decelerate in that Rx direction. And then the Ry tells us whether or not the wheel would decelerate or accelerate laterally. Right? And that really ties to the direction, being able to control the direction of the tire. So this will cause acceleration or deceleration um, lateral to the path, or normal, excuse normal, normal to the path. Um, then if there is an Ry, you could steer the tire, right? Change its lateral path. Okay, so those are the two things we want to think about. And I want to think about several scenarios now, um, which are going to be extreme cases, and then the more blurry intermediate cases. The first one is going to be when um, omega equals zero, we have the wheel locked to the axle, and this corresponds to braking. Okay, so we'll call that axle locked. This is the braking situation, omega equals zero relative to the axle. So in each of these cases, we'll think of two scenarios, one with a slip angle and one 
if you uh, without a slip angle and then one if you add a slip angle. So I'll start by drawing this circular path that the wheel is guaranteed to be following. And actually, let me draw that a bigger arc um, so we can do both on the same arc. Okay, so we've got an arc that this wheel is following. If I locate a point where the wheel is and then draw a tangent line to the arc, and this is going to, the point's going to represent the center of the wheel, then we have to, um, if, it, if this point is moving along the path, which we know it is, um, there has to be a constant velocity We'll call it U of that point. And if we have theta dot as constant, and then I could call this radi radius uh, big R, then we're going to get U equal to theta dot R. Sorry, it's supposed to be big R. U theta dot big R. So there's our velocity. Now let's add the tire to the picture. And in this case, we have no slip angle. So I'll draw a tire. It's tangent to this. So in this scenario, alpha equals zero. No slip angle. Tire is perfectly aligned. Um, we can draw our axle like so. And think about um, the two components. Let me get my directionality right. We'll have. Uh, Rx and Ry. Two unknown forces there. We'll add our i, j, and k. So we have i hat, j hat. Okay, so we got locked braking, <clears throat> locked wheel, mega equals zero, wheels just being dragged along this circle, and there will be a friction force. And in this case, the friction force, let me use um, blue for forces, is always going to be opposing the velocity. We can draw the friction force here. And that means, in this case, it's always aligned with I hat. And it's essentially some mu in the longitudinal direction times that magnitude of the normal force. And pointed opposite of the velocity. If we solve for Rx and Ry now, which are the only forces involved, um, we'll see that no lateral force to the tire is generated here, only this longitudinal force. So we can write out what the forces are. Rx is going to be mu x of z, ry equals zero. So in this case, the wheel just goes in the direction of the velocity and it'll slow down eventually, decelerate. But there's no lateral forces, so it wouldn't change path. If I just instantly let go, disconnected it from the axle, um, 
it would not generate any lateral force and it would just continue along in the direction of the red line. So we can also think about then, well, what if this has a slip angle? So we pick a point here and you can draw the tangent line to the surface. This time though, we're gonna have the, the tire pointed in a different direction. So I can define then the slip angle and we'll first add, here's our velocity vector, right? Always goes tangent to this circle. It's at a constant value, u. And now our tire is angled some value theta of alpha here. from the velocity vector, right? We've pointed the tire in the direction we want it. I can add the axle in, it would look like this. Cut it off. We'll do forces in blue. We wanna know what Rx and Ry are. So we also know, we know here, it's just sliding across the ground, the wheel's not rolling, that the friction force then acting on the tire from the ground has got to oppose that velocity vector. Same thing as the other situation. And then this is friction force here. Now, notice that this friction force, um, if it's broken up into components along the entire longitudinal, entire lateral dimensions, then we can draw those two components. But this one is fx, and this one is fy. And this is the total friction force. Okay, so we can, by turning wheel, we can generate um, components of force along the i and j vectors there. But uh, if we solve for Rx and Ry, okay, remember that Rx tells us, can we speed up or slow down along the path? Ry tells us we will be able to change direction. And in this case, the Rx is still, whatever the magnitude here is, F, F of F, and that equals mu x, we'll just call it mu, times some normal force. And then Ry is only um, zero, just like the case before. <clears throat> so no matter what we do here, we can't generate an Ry component. Even if I turn the wheel, 
And the conclusion that we can draw from this situation, when we lock the brakes, um, is you know the is a couple things. One, um, wheel uh, steering the wheel, steering the tire. Will not change its direction. All right, so we'd have to have a RY component to get any kind of deviation from the path. In this case, or deviation from getting that U vector to change. So that's the main thing. And steering the tire will not change its direction. Um, another is the uh, magnitude of the friction force is some kinetic friction coefficient mu times Fc, and that's it. Axle locked braking. So that's scenario one. Um, scenario, the next scenario we're going to think about, well, let's send this wheel along the path and it can roll this time. Call that free rolling. Draw my path again. Circular path, this thing. We're Guarantee that the wheel follows this circular path. We pick a point here, add a tangent line, draw a tire. In this case, we'll have, uh, I wanted to write um, alpha equals zero. And it's also worth noting that um, omega, in this case, times the dynamic radius of the tire is going to equal u. Right? That's the free rolling case. We add our velocity vector, same every time. Got you there, and if it's rolling, and we don't have any kind of lateral fr friction, then we get no components of force acting on this wheel. By the ground. I hat, J hat. RY, RX. Um, this implies then that RX equals zero or y equals zero. We wouldn't feel any forces internally to this axle generated by the ground on the tire. It just rolls freely, goes around the, the track. All right, so that's that situation. Well, what if we had a slip angle? We can think about that situation. We're on the track over here, draw a tangent line. The velocity of the center of the wheel will be along that tangent line, same magnitude u. But this time we're going to have a slip angle, some amount. Draw our tire. In that case, and the axle.
unknown forces. X. We draw on that wrong. Our X, our Y. I do that. Our X, our Y. All right. In this case, <clears throat> there we will be a friction force. The, you can imagine if, if I set the slip angle to 90 degrees, the wheel would stop rolling, and then we would get a maximal friction force lateral to the, to the tire. But in the intermediate case, we're going to generate some kind of force that is um, in this direction. Oh, well, that's a friction force. I missed up there. So the only the the direction in the I direction, we won't have any resistance it'll roll. But in the J direction, we're going to have a force that the ground applies to the contact patch of the tire. It looks like so. Some lateral force there. doesn't have any component in the I direction all everything's in the J direction and we're going to define that force too for small angles we can make it a C alpha times alpha all right so just recall that this is only valid for alpha is small if that's the case we can then solve for the RX and the RY So you can see that there's a component in the RY direction and a component in the RX direction that is a function of alpha. So alpha is this angle. And then the Rx component if we solve this we're going to get that Rx equals um, C alpha alpha times cosine alpha And the RY component is going to be C alpha alpha sine alpha. Did I get that wrong? Oh, yeah. It's not alpha. This angle is alpha, so we'll get opposite there. All right, if we remember, then Rx tells us um, if I if I turn the steering and it's free rolling, will I be able to get acceleration or deceleration along the path? And Ry, will I be able to change get acceleration or deceleration? lateral to the path, which is equates to, can I steer the vehicle? If we think of alpha as small, this approximately equals C alpha, alpha squared. Two small numbers times each other 
it's approximately equal to zero. So we really can't change the velocity along the path very much by steering at small angles. But for the y component, we have C alpha alpha, cosine alpha being one. And that means that we can steer this. And this equates to a, um, you know, if you were riding on a single tired vehicle and you could steer that relative to the you know, structure that you're sitting on, you could change the direction. And this is equivalent to you get in a cart, if you can steer it, you don't have to be able to accelerate or decelerate, but if you can change the direction of the wheels, you can give it a slip angle and you can direct that cart. Um, soapbox derby cars are just like that, as steering. Right, ride down the hill, steer it in the direction you want to go. So that makes sense. We have this RY component. So the conclusion here is um, you can steer a free rolling tire. Because we can generate this force along the R, this R Y force, and that comes from this lateral slip angle that we can cause, and then it generates this force at the tire patch. All right, what's next? What about the next other another extreme? I'm going to pause this. The next scenario that I want to go over is going to be when the wheel is spinning much faster than the free rolling case. Um, you might call this a burnout. So this is the case when omega times the dynamic radius of the tire is much, much greater than u. And the tire is just uh, skidding on the ground uh, due to this spin rate. It corresponds to um, the longitudinal acceleration slip SD equals 1. So if I draw the path, tire moves in the tire machine we get this arc once again pick a point let's look at the no slip angle condition first we'll have uh, the center of the wheel would be traveling with a velocity vector u tangent to the path and then draw my tire and the axle we're going to be looking for the reaction forces again Rx Ry and omega in this case is rotating in that direction so fast that the wheel is just spinning. This is going to give us a friction force at the tire contact patch from the ground onto the tire that is in line with that velocity vector. And this is a lot the longitudinal component 
and uh, it fundamentally equals some um, mu times FC or we can also um, say that it's some function of SD for the no slip angle condition uh, Rx and Ry are easily found uh, when the wheel's spinning it can't transmit any lateral force so Ry is going to be zero in this case and Rx is going to be negative mu x fc and that corresponds to uh, the wheel wants to accelerate in the direction of u in this case and that was slip angle equals zero We look at the case where the tire then has a slip angle. Still has this velocity component U. tangent and then we introduce some slip angle alpha in this case draw a tire And we already talked about how the spinning tire can't generate any lateral force. So we'll only see a force in the direction of what, uh, that the wheel is pointed that's going to try to advance it along its I axis. So we'll get some component here that is FX equals mu FC. Same as before, but no lateral force is generated. We can put our reaction forces again and then we can calculate what those are. Our x is going to be have a negative mu x fz cosine alpha, and our y is going to have a negative mu x fc sine alpha this approximately equals to mu x fc for small slip angles and um, mu x fc alpha if alpha is a small number this rx is pretty small we can get uh, and our x is going to be much greater than our y in this case. So here we can generate some lateral 
for some um, component in that ry force component, which would change the direction. So we can get a little bit of steering control, but it's going to be overwhelmed by the tire accelerating along the tangent path with using that uh, that shows up with that rx component okay so if the tire is spinning doing a burnout um, we also have little control uh, little to no control in steering Um, and it will show later too that uh, in this case um, it is not a max lateral force. Okay, for the next scenario, we're going to think about. Uh, the case in between the wheel burning out that we just went over and the free rolling wheel. And this is when you're pushing, uh, adding, uh, accelerating the wheel, trying to go faster. Um, we're only going to think about, though, a small um, increase in acceleration so that we can stay in a linear regime. So, so accelerating from free rolling case. And in this case, the omega r is not going to be equal to the speed u, the center of the axle, um, but it'll be that plus a little sort of delta omega r. This little small increase, and it and we see this when the axle is uh, advancing faster than the contact patch due to the deformation of the tire. And we can think about this case also um, in terms of the uh, no slip angle and the slip angle. Um, another thing to recall for this linear case the longitudinal slip value SD is going to be for typical tires between 0 and 0.125. All right, and I'll show a graph of that later. Recall that S of D is a function of both omega and u. Right? To be able to figure that out, we've got to know what those are. So I'll start by drawing our tire testing machine's circular path again. We'll pick a point to think about the no-slip case. Draw the tangent line. Add the velocity, which is always the same. Direction. We have our U, draw the tire, no slip angle, and the axle comes back, cut it off, give it a center line, and we can start to think about the forces at this point. So we're going to solve for the reaction forces Rx and Ry in this case, and um, the wheel, remember, is kind of omega, and we're going to go a little faster so that our, our U is faster than what we expect with a rigid tire. And 
what this will produce um, in our case we don't have any slip angle so we can't get any lateral side force but we will see a force at the contact patch in the same direction as this velocity and if we were to disconnect the wheel from the axle it would want to accelerate forward due to our increased um, amount here and that's going to be this longitudinal velocity x for the linear case we can write just it's some constant c s d times s d is going to give us that force and we'll come back to that to think about it a little more so here we can't generate any lateral force but we can go ahead and solve for our rx and our y and for the no slip angle case the rx value in our is going to be negative fx and this negative sd csd sd and then um, our y is zero so if we then look at the slip angle case here you can draw that situation a dot get a tangent line we know that the velocity is always tangent to the path there u at the center of the wheel but in this case we will have some slip angle tire will be aligned like so um, the axle still goes to the center of the large circle and we define our slip angle alpha we're going to be looking for these unknown forces again our x, our y. In this case, um, we can generate some lateral force now that we have this slip angle. So that's going to be in this direction relative to the tire, Fy, and that's a C alpha alpha for this, for small angles of alpha. We can get a hold of that force and we'll also have this small accelerating force force due to the uh, acceleration fx equals cd sd as we had before so we've got these two components and if we solve for the rx and the ry um, we'll see that we have both of those in this um, Both of these components now will register in both the Rx and Ry. So Rx is going to be C alpha alpha times sine alpha. We're trying to decompose both of these in these two directions from those dotted blue lines. Um, minus CSD SD cos alpha. And then Ry equals negative C alpha alpha cos alpha minus C SD SD sine alpha. So those are the two components. We can see that we have um, that both the longitudinal uh, or both the Rx and the Ry have these components, but some of these are sort of going to drop to zero. Um, this goes to one both the cosine alphas if we have small alphas and uh, the sine alphas go to alpha and then we have rx equals c alpha alpha squared minus csd sd this alpha squared is two small numbers multiplied by each other so that's basically zero and then we have uh, negative c alpha alpha minus csd sd 
alpha. Um, so what does this tell us? This tells us that the slip angle is only going to let us help us change the direction that we're going, this ry component. But accelerating can actually help us turn faster. We can advance in the direction that we want to turn with that additional ry term here. But if alpha is a, if alpha is small, this isn't going to contribute. Um, may not contribute a huge value. C, uh, CSD, CD can be as high as one, but the slope of uh, C, al C alpha can be a much higher. So we have R Y here, um, and then R X. Uh, we basically you know, accelerating uh, the wheel is going to just help us advance along the path. So the conclusion for this accelerating case is that we can steer, which is good, and that accelerating can help us steer. So conclusion, can steer, right? We have an RY component. And that accelerating um, helps steer. Okay, so we can if you have a slip angle and then you accelerate, you will steer more you know, in, more into the direction uh, that you want to go there. Right. So that's useful. Now um, let's talk about the braking situation. So for braking, this is also going to be just um, a small amount of braking relative to the free rolling. Uh, case and I called it above uh, from the free rolling case. So breaking from free rolling case. And here, um, omega r is going to be equal to the u minus minus some small delta omega r. All right. So the um, center of the axle will not advance as fast as the contact patch. And this is small here. Um, this is also going to correspond to the longitudinal slip value between about 0 and 0, 1.25 for sort of a typical car tire. So once again, we can draw the no slip case in a slip case to see what this behavior is going to look like. So I'll give the path of the tire testing machine in this large arc. I'm going to draw our two cases starting with the no slip case. Velocity is always going to be a, a tangent to and constant. Here, head tire, at no slip angle, axle. We're going to solve for our x and our y, and um, I've forgotten to put the. I've got the unit vectors attached to the wheel there, I hat, J hat, now when we break, there's going to be a force that's going to slow down things in uh, at the contact patch we will feel that as a resistive force pointing in the opposite direction of the steer along the fx direction so here fx and that's going to be approximately a csb times sb uh, for the small braking 
um, situation. We can quickly solve for Rx and Ry and find that we've got this Rx component, but once again, no Ry component. So if we then look at the slip ang case with a slip angle, um, we should see something similar to the accelerating one, but with just some changes, changes of sign and behavior. So I'll draw that. Velocity. U um, at a slip angle of alpha. Draw the tire. Then a little longer. And then the axle it goes to the center of the circle. Add the I hat, J hat unit vectors. And then we're going to have two components of force. The slip angle is going to give us our lateral force, as we did in the last case, generated in this direction. And that's Fy equals C alpha alpha, again, once again. But the braking, um, now we have this direction for our Fx equals CSB SB. So we got these two components. We can solve for Rx and Ry to help us think about whether or not we'll be able to steer. Can we generate lateral force? Um, I think we surely can, but the braking has a different effect than the an opposite effect as the accelerating. So we can write out uh, what Rx and Ry there? Rx is going to equal C alpha alpha sine alpha plus CSB SB cosine alpha. And then Ry negative C alpha alpha cosine alpha, same as before, but then a plus CSB SB sine alpha. Once again, it goes to 1, alpha, 1, alpha, and then this whole thing will go to 0. And we can break along the path with, this, with the uh, Fx force, CSB, SB. But for the Ry, we once again um, can affect the steering, but if you break, you won't, you're going to uh, decrease your ability to steer in the direction that you're pointed in this case, right? Because there's opposite signs. We've got a negative and a positive there. So in braking, we can steer the vehicle. We have this R, R, Y. We can steer, um, but braking um, will uh, reduce ability to steer. When you lock the brakes, then you can't steer at all, right? So Those are the basic conclusions. So those are all the scenarios. And the regime in between 
these small braking and small acceleration, and then the other two extremes, um, locked brakes and spinning out, burning out, um, those, those get more murky because the models are not linear, and I can't just write these simple C alpha alpha and C SB SB. Um, so we'll, I'm going to talk about now what that entails if we want to think about um, how these tires behave outside of those these specific scenarios. All right, so all the previous things we've talked about really only set those up for small, uh, that are only valid for small values of alpha, SB, and SD. So all previous only valid for small alpha, SB, SD, okay? Um, or the other extreme cases, the spinning and the in the lock breaking. All right. In between those cases, when we're um, things get a little much more nonlinear. So let's look at a couple of graphs um, to think about that. Uh, if I just think about the lateral slip, we could make a plot. If I take the slip angle alpha on this on the x-axis and then fy on the y-axis for a specific tire, a specific normal force, For a specific road, um, and it goes on and on. Specific camber angle, um, even tire dimensions, tire material properties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we have to hold all of those things constant to try to think about how can one specific variable, in this case alpha affect the lateral slip. All these other things affect it too. But if we hold all those all those constant, we will get a graph that has, looks a little like this. Um, you get a max, sort of max friction here at the top. That's the max lateral force you could generate at some alpha. Uh, and then beyond that, we're skidding. But there's a regime here that for an automobile tire might be between zero and 10 degrees or so slip angle that is linear or close enough to be linear that, that we can use that. Okay, so that slope of that, that is the C alpha that we've been mentioning before. But notice that we change alpha um, beyond 10 degrees then we get more interesting behavior. Um, if you want to add one more variable in there, let's say normal force, you can check out figure 4.3. And it shows Fy as a function of alpha and Fz. And then you get quite a complex relationship. All right, so just look at that figure to get some idea of that. Um, that's the lateral slip. Well, what about the um, longitudinal slip? We can make a similar graph. And let's just do this for longitudinal slip breaking. If I plot versus SB, the um, longitudinal force you can generate starting at zero to one where zero represents the free rolling case 
and then one SP equal one is locked breaks. This curve has a much steeper initial part, tops out and drops and gets to an end, end value there. You can see that it has a max friction here. Okay, and that's when it's breaking to about 12% of the speed that the axle is traveling. And there is a um, sort of uh, uh, maybe 25% is more accurate. And the linear portion here goes to about 12%. Um, we could take a slope of that, call that CSP, right? So if we're just breaking a little bit, maybe we could use a, a linear model there. But beyond that, we get different behavior. And note that this uh, far right portion corresponds to uh, just the um, kinetic coefficient of friction during sliding. It's interesting to note that you can get a you can get better friction if the wheel is is not just sliding if it's actually still rolling. So that's very useful. Um, once again, this is a specific tire. Specific normal force. Specific road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have to hold all these things in general. Uh, in general, the tires are very nonlinear, and you have to create some function of all of these things, downforce, road, materials, tire dimensions, uh, slip angle, longitudinal slip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to know exactly what the latitude, la longitudinal, and latitudinal for, uh, longitudinal and lateral forces are going to be. So we can think about this uh, a little in a more a little more complex way, um, and I'm going to pause right now, catch my breath, and I'll come back. Okay. The next thing I want to do is um, try to explain the last figure um, or second to last figure in the book that plots the lateral force versus the longitudinal force and gives uh, these lines of constant slip angle. So this figure, we're going to draw, so I want plenty of space for this. In this case, the uh, y-axis will represent the lateral force that you can generate and the x-axis is going to be the longitudinal force you can generate where to the right we're going to call it braking and to the left accelerating So, at a given slip angle, and we'll start with thinking about what, this, uh, what happens with a small slip angle. If um, I have a small slip angle, I basically um, cannot generate any lateral force if the brakes are locked that value is going to be quite small. So we can start with a point here and it'll be just a tiny bit above the axis. And this corresponds to the locked brakes at 
a small slip angle. Okay. Now, also with the lock brakes, I can imagine at a, a very large slip angle, 90 degrees, the wheel is suddenly perpendicular to its path of travel. And in this case, we can get a maximum slip angle. I mean, a maximum la uh, lateral force when the brakes are locked. So this we'll call slip angle equals 90 degrees. And this is still locked brakes. Okay, so all I'm doing is changing the direction the wheel is turning. If it's pointing directly in the way direction it's going, we get FX equals some value, and I'll call it 1500 Newton for this particular tire. And then if I rotate the wheel 90 degrees to its path, we can get 1500 Newtons in the lateral direction. So if I start at this locked brakes at a small slip angle and go to a large slip angle, these are actually going to follow an arc, a circular arc. And this is increasing slip angle. for locked brakes. So I can pick any slip angle. Here's slip angle 45, right? So I have equal contributions of FX and FY. Slip angle 22.5. Slip angle equals 67.5. Right? So we can find out if I have lock, brakes locked, and I check out different slip angles, it's going to tell me what FX and FY is going to be. It's along this circular arc here. All right, so that's interesting. Well, what if we're at the free rolling case? The free rolling case corresponds to anything on this vertical axis that is um, not a slip angle of 90. That top one we get locked because we're directly um, perpendicular to the path. But we can pick off a small slip angle, alpha is small. And if alpha is small, we can generate a C alpha times alpha. Right? Get some lateral force in the free rolling case, um, but no longitudinal force because it's the wheel's just rolling. Now, if we hold the const, uh, slip angle constant, we could think about well, what is a curve that connects. Um, I'll say point 0.1 and point 0.2 for constant slip angle. They're both small slip angle. We get the brakes locked over to the free rolling case. Well, it turns out that um, as you apply the brakes at a constant slip angle, we'll be able to generate about that constant, a constant. Um, lateral force but as we move further out eventually we um, lose the ability the harder we break to generate a lateral force and it's going to drop and in fact the harder we even break even harder lateral force will drop to zero down at the locked brake case. So we get this sh shape here for the braking situation. And it's governed by 
two curves, the in-breaking with the longitudinal slip and the lateral slip curves look like as a function of alpha, or if alpha is held small, as a function of SB. So this curve corresponds to um, SB equals zero and SB equals one. This dot out here, the maximum lateral force that you can join is SB approximately equal to zero point One two five, I think, is what was in the book, and it starts decreasing. Starts decreasing about point one two five. So this is a parametric curve, okay. Parametric curve. Um, where the parameter is SB. If I vary SB, I can, can hold alpha constant. Then I can trace what, find out what lateral force and what longitudinal force I'll get, and I can trace out this curve. So just to put that into perspective, um, you could draw for break, the breaking side um, alpha small. We can draw the lateral slip. All right? What is Fy going to be if uh, I have a small slip angle? And it's going to look, right, holds flat. I'm sorry, this is not alpha. As a function of SB. And then we want to draw a similar curve. Fx as a function of SB. 1, 0, 1, 0. We already know what the one on the right looks like. We get this steep descent, the peak drops down to some value. This is about 1.25. Now, Fy, it holds constant out to, I don't know, 0.1 or so, and then starts decreasing, and it'll go to zero. And it turns out it looks something like this. We'll call this 0.125. So as I vary SB from 0 to 1, this tells me what Fx and Fy are, and then I can plot them on the, on the, um, oh yeah, plot them on the curve above. All right, we're back. It also goes for accelerating. If we say alpha, um, oh geez, this thing is not responding. Come on. All right, I'll be back. Okay, I'm back after that technical difficulty. So we were looking at the braking curves as a function of Z of SB, 0 to 1, where alpha is small. You can also draw, draw the acceleration curves, Fx, Fy, as a function of SD. And in this case, the acceleration curve for the Fx, it looks similar. So we've been drawing it. 1, 0, if this corresponds to spinning out, and this corresponds to free rolling. Uh, 
a peak also, well, maybe about at 1.125. But on the Fy case, we know that when it's spinning out, we can't generate any lateral force. So this is going to have to be zero for that small slip angle. Um, but it, uh, it has a similar behavior. It hangs out, and then it drops down to zero, which I didn't draw very well. 0, 0.0. 1.0. So now we could plot these curves, fx and fy, as we vary sd up in this parametric graph. Uh, it turns out that in the spinning we'll have this same 1500 newtons, right? Similar, uh, the same static coefficient of friction, I mean, sorry, the kinetic coefficient of friction. And as we increase SB, we get constant, and then it drops back to zero, just like we did before. So this is SD increasing as we accelerate more, and that point out there corresponds to that 0.125, that peak. So this is for a small slip angle. If we come back down to these graphs and think about what a large slip angle um, might look like, we're going to get a different behavior. At a large slip angle for braking and for accelerating, for a small SD or SB near the free rolling, we can generate a lot of lateral force. So for the braking, we'll get some max that'll come down, but it won't go to zero in that case. So this is, we'll call it large slip angle. Um, and fx and f, uh, fx, fx, the longitudinal isn't going to change much with respect to slip angle. But the fy, we also can get a large and accelerating, but it's going to drop to zero, right? Because we can't generate any lateral force when it's spinning out. Right, so the braking and the accelerating have a little bit different profile as we vary how much you brake or how much you accelerate. Accelerating will always go to zero in the lateral force, but we can always keep a lateral force when braking. So you'll have more control, or always have control, even at large slip angle, when you're braking, you'll be able to generate some lateral force, which is nice, unless your slip angle is uh, quite small and you brake hard. But we can generate some lateral force here. So how do those curves for the large alpha, make some small, translate up to our parametric curve? <coughs> so it turns out, I'll call 22.5 large, that um, if we plot those, notice that we start at some value of Fy and um, decreases as we increase as B, keeping alpha constant. Um, so we'll see that, pick this point, this is where the SB equals 1, and where SB equals 0, we get a lot more lateral force. So this is um, at a very, um, this corresponds to the SB equals zero free rolling. For alpha equals 22.5, for example. So the way this curve looks then, if you plot the FX and FY, going to get a maximum fx. This is going to make a nice curve up there to give this maximum fy. And remember, this whole thing is alpha equals 22.5 degrees, constant slip angle. <clears throat> so if we have a large slip angle, we can generate sort of a maximal uh, lateral force at this 22.5, and 
and but we can't generate as much longitudinal force as we did with a small slip angle. And then the accelerating curve, right, it has to go back to zero for the Fy. So that means that all curves, no matter what their slip angle is, are, have to, if I can draw it right, have to return to zero. And they're going to look something like that. And remember, this is still alpha equals 22.5. I like this one to redraw it. All right. So we could draw lines for every single alpha value. They're always going to start on this half uh, quarter circle on the braking side. That tells us the locked brake scenario along that curve. And they'll pass through the free rolling case where it gets maximal Fy but no F, uh, Fc, Fx. And then we can generate Fy and acceleration, but uh, eventually the wheel will spin out right here. And this is spin out, SD equals one. So this is a parametric view of the graphs that I draw here for different large and small slip angles. Um, there is a maximal curve. Uh, if you look at the book, the one for the around 12 uh, degree slip angle gives you sort of a you can get the maximum lateral force. Maximum lateral force is going to let you take the tightest turns. And a racer, a race car driver, trying to do that, is basically trying to hang on this top curve for whenever it accelerates or decelerates about its sort of constant speed. Um, it's going to change. You want to change your um, slip angle such that you can stay on this outer curve and try to maintain as much um, lateral force as you can to get around the curve that you want. Okay, that closes it. All this was a big mouthful, a lot going on in all these graphs. I'll post these in the video. Everything is close to right. I got a few mistakes in here. Uh, one thing to point out is I said at the beginning of the video that omega was about j. Um, reverse that. It's about the negative j so that if we increase vega, it makes theta advanced. And um, that just gets little sign corrections there and keeps that consistent. Uh, but I think the rest of the stuff is pretty much as I wanted to say. You'll have to look through these and think about them carefully about how contact patch force um, changes with different scenarios and then the last bit here too that tries to put into context how nonlinear the car the car tires can get and um, how that affects things there's so many parameters involved that um, outside of these sort of small linear regimes it's tough to model but there are models for that and I've included two papers two papers on canvas, the famous magic tire formula from Pacheca, and then the Solani model that I showed you in the in class that you guys can look at those papers to get an idea of the complexity in the tire modeling. All right. All right. Thanks for listening and bearing with the vid these first videos.